Spirit writing, also known as automatic writing, was once a thing, a big thing. Everybody was doing it. At the end of the 19th century and up to the First World War, everybody was talking to the spirits. This was through raps, voices, apports, or many other apparent manifestations. But what I want to focus on in this article is the art and science of spirit writing. At that time, rather famous people dabbled in this method of extracting information from the spirit world. W.B. Yeats, the winner of the 1923 Nobel Prize for Literature, and Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, a friend of Harry Houdini and creator of Sherlock Holmes, were both great believers in automatic writing. I don't want to get hung up with what these spirits are or were. For this article, we'll suspend disbelief and accept that the recipients of the automatic writing believed them to be some kind of discarnate, intelligent, and independent intelligence. The main question is whether automatic writing can produce valuable, actionable information that is reliable. If so, then automatic writing would become a useful tool for all sorts of research. Some practitioners, see Bly Bond below, claim to have used it for that very purpose. The critical point is, can the spirits tell us anything useful? How to do it? A famous practitioner of automatic writing or spirit writing, or inspired writing, was William Stainton Moses. He wrote a book called Spirit Teachings, published in 1883, where he sets out the method. He describes his technique of obtaining messages from the spirits. Sometimes he would hold a pen and let the spirit use his hand without any conscious direction from himself. Or, occasionally, he would use a planchette. A planchette, from the French meaning little plank, is a piece of wood, sometimes on rollers, with a hole for a stylus or pencil. You can buy one on Amazon. Very interestingly, Stainton Moses says that messages came more easily when writing on tables that were habitually used for that purpose. At first, he says, the writing was small and irregular, and he had to write cautiously and watch his hand following the lines with his eye, or the script would soon become mere scribble. Does this imply some conscious control? As Stainton Moses got better at automatic writing, the handwriting became very regular and beautifully formed, he says. He wrote the questions at the top of the page and then the answers would flow down from them. The spirits had a reasonable command of punctuation and they would set out their answers in appropriate paragraphs. These words of the spirits were of sincerity and sober, serious purpose, as befits ghosts writing for a true Victorian. Over time, Staint and Moses communicated with different spirits. They would sign themselves with their important titles, doctor, teacher, rector, and finally the boss spirit, imperator, which means emperor. Stainton Moses says that the spirits conveyed information that he had not previously known. Stainton Moses' spirits gave him inspiring words with a Christian, albeit a rather unorthodox spiritualist Christian flavour. Reading through his book Spirit Teachings, I didn't find much valuable teaching that I wanted to absorb and digest, unlike when I'm on YouTube. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Conan Doyle's series of spirit messages began with communications from his dead father, which he describes thus. A week after my father's funeral, I was writing a business letter when something seemed to intervene between my hand and the motor centres of my brain, and the hand wrote at an amazing rate a letter signed with my father's signature and purporting to come from him. I was upset, and my right side and arm became cold and numb. For a year after this, letters came frequently, and always at unexpected times. I never knew what they contained until I examined them with a magnifying glass. They were microscopic, and they contained a vast amount of matter, with which it was impossible for me to be acquainted. But mainly the automatic writing was transmitted by his wife, Lady Jean Conan Doyle, born Lecky. The writing began in 1921, and initially consisted of messages from personal friends who had died. In April 1922, Conan Doyle was contacted by his guide, Phineas. And Phineas was not a deceased friend, but a man who had lived in Arabia many centuries previously. By 1924, Jean stopped writing and spoke in a trance-like state. 
this development moved her onto which is technically channeling. Interestingly, as automatic writing died out, channeling became the most prominent method by which the spirits and aliens, if they aren't the same thing, spoke to us mere mortals. There are many cases of channeling from the 1970s and later, which we won't talk about here. Conan Doyle produced a book called Phineas Speaks. Conan Doyle calls automatic writing inspired writing to take account that the spirits inspire it. He notes in the preface to the book that information was given quite often prophecies of the future, but that some of this information was inaccurate. Conan Doyle was quite convinced that his wife wrote information produced that was not within her previous knowledge or awareness. One example of this was when a spirit mentioned an Italian who played cricket who just died. Conan Doyle says the name was difficult to read but ended in the letters C-I-N-I. Conan Doyle was doubtful about this snippet from the spirit world, as he didn't know any Italians who could play cricket. Still, a few days later they learned that an Italian called Paravicini, who had played cricket for Middlesex County, died two days before the communication. None present were aware they knew this. This might be some slight evidence that the information didn't originate in Jean's subconscious. However, other explanations exist. For instance, that she had heard someone mention the cricketer's passing in passing, but didn't remember because the fact hadn't registered in her conscious memory. Conan Doyle was clear that the spirits were not omniscient, and he says they can be wrong as much as we can be wrong. Reading through Phineas Speaks, I see that most of the spirits had come to Conan Doyle during these sessions, writing Christian terms in line with Conan Doyle's Christian spiritualist beliefs. For example, they say the day will soon come when every knee in the world shall bend to Christ, but that hasn't happened yet. There was nothing much in Conan Doyle's book of spirit writings that struck me as valuable information. Phineas didn't inspire any highlighting from me. William Butler Yeats Yeats, the famous Irish poet, was also a renowned member of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn and interested in mythology, gods, spirits and ghosts all of his life. He married a much younger woman called... Georgina Hyde Lees, whom he called George. She was 25 and he 52, and both were members of the Golden Dawn, and she had a reputation for being psychic. Only days after their wedding in October 1917, at Ashdown Forest Hotel, Georgina, or George as he insisted on calling her, because it gave him more opportunity for rhymes, started producing automatic writing. In the end, there were 4,000 pages of this writing. Whereas Conan Doyle's material was very Christian spiritualist in tone, Yeats's spirits delivered messages in line with the occult and magical worldview Yeats was interested in. This disparity suggests arguments both for and against the truth of spirit communications. The argument against is that they are inconsistent worldviews. Yeats is occult, Conan Doyle's is Christian. However, the lack of consistency doesn't prove anything. If you were to visit my house, you would see I have lots of books of ghost stories, whereas if you went to my mother's house, you would see mainly detective novels. Some folk read ghost stories, and some folk read detective novels. So there may be Christian spirits and hermetic spirits. Because there are both doesn't mean there are neither. In contrast to Conan Doyle's material, the spirit writing from Yeats' is The Vision talks about occult systems and refers to Buddhist ideas and Japanese no-drama. Yeats's guide or control is called Emeritus. It seems that contacts have to have highfalutin names. Carl Jung's contact was Philemon. Emeritus' advice to Yeats, amusingly, was to spend more time writing poetry and less reading automatic script. On reading, the systems expounded by the spirits in what came to be Yeats's A Vision are linked to the occult systems he sketched out long before the automatic writing began. He'd been interested in this stuff all his life. The spirit writing merely confirmed what he believed anyway. I must admit, I haven't been able to peruse all of Yeats' material, but once again, I didn't find information that's generally useful to anyone but Yeats. I get more value from clickbait. Frederick Bly Bond The book that contains Frederick Bly Bond's information received by automatic writing is called The Gate of Remembrance. Bly Bond had been official archaeologist at the ruins of Glastonbury Abbey from 1908 until 1921, when the bishop fired him. 
Bly Bond, trained as an architect, but had an abiding interest in the occult and paranormal. Long before he was appointed as archaeologist, he had believed that the abbey was built according to occult principles, namely the Hebrew gematria. Gematria links words for mystical rather than philological or semantic reasons. Bly Bond believed that Glastonbury Abbey and other cathedrals were built following patterns of occult numbers. When reading the spirit communications to Bly Bond, again the Christian influences are evident. He was brought up an Anglican, Episcopalian, and his father was an Anglican vicar. His education and erudition were also apparent. For example, his ghostly collaborators wrote in Latin and pretty good Middle English. Bly Bond approaches the investigations in a thoroughly respectable academic manner, and the book resembles a paper for one of the antiquarian journals of the day, until he mentions that he's getting his information from ghosts via a seer. Again, as with Conan Doyle and Yeats, Bly Bond doesn't do the spirit writing himself, it comes through his colleague Captain Alain. Now, interestingly, the same was true for uh, Dr John Dee in the Elizabethan times, and his, uh, his um, seer was a man called Edward Kelly, he was a bit of a rogue. I'm sure I'll talk about that at some other point. In the writings to Bly Bond that came through this Captain Alain, which wasn't his real name, a whole crowd of monks seek to come through from different historical periods. In one case, there's a Saxon who can't speak because he's been dead too long and doesn't have the language, which is very interesting. Interestingly, the monks write in Latin and in an old-fashioned type of English, but they never write in Anglo-Saxon. I wonder if Captain Elaine didn't know any Anglo-Saxon. Blybond is not happy with the standard of the monks' Latin and says it's the type of Latin you might expect from half-literate monks using what scraps of Latin they've picked up from their service books. I am not expert enough to analyse the English the monks speak, but it doesn't look like proper Middle English, such as you would find in Chaucer. It looks like ye oldy fashioned English, spiced with some archaic words, for example, eno for enough, sen for since, and guerdon for a reward. Similar doubts can be cast on whether the brand of English spoken by the medieval monks is authentically what would have been spoken in those times at Glastonbury. The monks say, on several occasions, that they are not dead, that what is speaking is only some part of them that's still bound to the abbey through affection. Bly Bond is most rigorous in his method. He's clear that the information gleaned from the monks enabled him to find previously unknown archaeological structures. His claim, therefore, is that by using psychological methods, he was able to obtain objectively verifiable evidence. But on the face of it, in Blybond's case, the automatic writing actually seems to have produced some actionable and accurate information. My own experience. This personal experience happened some years ago and is the reason for my interest in the topic of automatic writing. At that time in my life, I was a tour guide for ghost tours around haunted castles and other such places in England and Ireland. There was a place not too far from me, a very historic and very haunted place called Dalston Hall. I must have had 40 or more trips to Dalston Hall. Our tour routine it was we would do the tour, then have something to eat in the dining room and then retire to the library. We lit the library with candles and I told stories of my experiences at Dalston Hall and elsewhere. The bulk of my material was the stories of all the hundreds of people who had come on our ghost trips across Britain and Ireland and told me their own true stories. Or stories at least that they believed to be true. On our tours we used electrical field detectors to pick up any unusual electrical fields that existed away from any power source hanging in the air. I use the EMF detectors a lot and I can tell you my hands and arms do not usually have a detectable electrical field. This particular night, I had the weirdest sensation in my right hand. It tingled, it felt animated. I scanned my hand with the EMF detector and the scanner lit up. This isn't usual and indicates an electrical field. I had the intuition that my hand wanted to write. I had never done anything like that before. But I picked up a pencil and out came this elaborate copper plate writing saying that John Dalston was there. We asked his name and his dates of birth and marriage. I forget exactly when, but it was in the early 1600s. We didn't get much sense out of him, 
but he said he'd marry an Irish Catholic woman, which would have been extraordinary for an English nobleman in those times. After the writing had finished, I went into the bar and the bar staff said, You seen a ghost? You're white. After that, I regularly tried to contact John Dalston at Dalston Hall. He came through, but he didn't have much to say for himself. I was also visited by George Dalston, who had different handwriting. Again, he was also pretty thin as a personality. But on the next visit to Dalston Hall, I tried again, and unexpectedly, a different script appeared on the paper, still different to mine. It wrote, Love. I thought that was nice, and it persisted and wrote, You are a well-loved fellow. It struck me as quite an archaic phrasing, so I asked it who it was, and it said, Rebecca Goffrey. I asked Rebecca who she was, and she said, Your wife. Now it so happens that I was married at the time, so I made some wisecrack which she ignored. I asked Rebecca what my name was, and she wrote, Davy Goffrey. She said I was a watcher for the king, and I still have no idea what that means. Rebecca said we had a child, and my father was a rope maker called John. Our son was named John too. I asked her, not John too, but John as well. Although it would have been funny if it had been John too. I asked her when and where we were married, and she said, Tuesday, July 14th, 1714, at St. Catherine's Church, London. So she wrote this down, and she spelled Catherine with a K, not the usual C. But when I looked up the date... July the 17th, 1714, wasn't a Tuesday. The significance of the C and the K, so Catherine with a K, didn't strike me at the time. The name Goffrey exists, though I hadn't previously heard of it, and there are several in the London phone book, but then probably every name under the sun is in the London phone book. I also looked up churches in London, and there is no St. Catherine's Church, so I thought the whole thing was a product of my imagination. Then, some years later, I was in London and I saw a sign for St. Catherine's Dock. But now it's a dock, actually a swanky marina, not a church. However, in the Middle Ages, where St. Catherine's Dock is now, was a hospital founded by a religious order and this hospital was dedicated to St. Catherine with a K and built around a church. The church was knocked down in 1825 to make way for the dock development. I didn't know this when the automatic writing came through but it was a densely populated area at that time and people got married there. I'm guessing that the name Goffrey is a variant of the more common Geoffrey. The whole episode was very odd. Rebecca doesn't write to me anymore, but it's still nice to think that someone out there in the ether thinks I'm a well-loved fellow. Confabulation. What to make of all this spirit writing? Perhaps there's a clue in the feature known as confabulation. So confabulation is a clinical feature of Korsakoff syndrome. So Korsakoff syndrome, also known as Korsakoff-Wernicke's syndrome, is a condition that's caused by chronic depletion of B vitamins, which is usually caused, or nearly always caused, by alcoholism. In this condition, people will speak fluently, grammatically, and at length, reporting experiences which haven't happened, but they are convinced to have. These utterances are characterised by what we call poverty of content, so they go on at length, they're quite fantastical, but they don't really convey any information. Confabulation can also occur in amnesia caused by brain disease or injury. Where there are considerable gaps in memory, the sufferer will simply make long, often involved stories up. Again, they mostly don't contain any valuable information, and a long speech is saying nothing much. It should be noticed that this confabulation is an unconscious process. The person producing the spouts of words believes what they're saying is real and genuine. It's just, it's not. Conclusion. There's always a conclusion. The automatic writing of the various spirits is often flowery and high-sounding, but the actual information content is minimal. When you read the pages and pages of spirit communications, you don't find much of value. I wonder, therefore whether automatic writing is a form of confabulation, unconsciously, of course. Humans are quite capable of spouting off lots of words that boil down to nothing much. I wonder whether the spirits do the same. Oh, by the way, uh, before I go, can I just ask you to subscribe to the channel and give this a like, and if you feel like it, give a comment, because uh, that really helps boost the channel. So, thanks in advance.